um, what limiting factors for wildlife, uh, what, what they mean, uh, the concept, the, uh, the idea of uh, all animals don't just exist on the landscape, uh, you know, in a random fashion, there's, there's reasons for their existence. And um, I hope to, uh, you know, share, uh, you know, several examples of uh, what limiting factors uh, are. Um, and also as applied scientists, as applied biologists, we um, also think about ways to mitigate those limiting factors. How do, how do, how do we uh, eliminate those limiting factors or, or um, add, the, add the, the ingredients to the habitat that the animal needs to survive? And I hope that um, one of the things about the Connecticut Envirothon is the, the staff here uh, on the uh, board and um, uh, we, a lot, lot of, a lot of our, our practicing, uh, you know, uh, professionals and uh, we want to share with you that applied science aspect as well as the um, learning facts. Okay, so I hope that uh, at the end of my talk, you'll, you'll have uh, a better idea of uh, what um, limiting factors are and um, with the examples that I share. Um, and, um, and, and if you ever think of uh, uh, going into a career in this, I, I hope that when, you know, we need replacement professionals out there. So anybody who aspires to do this kind of work, please, uh, you know, uh, pay attention and, and, and get, and, uh, and um, do, you know, get, be, be a practitioner of habitat management and, and uh, wildlife management. Okay. Wildlife need four things to survive, right? Food, water, shelter, cover, and space. They're very basic, right? The quality and the quantity of these four elements and their arrangement on the landscape creates the animal's habitat or the place where it can survive and meet its needs. So organisms need these four basic requirements in the proper arrangement. What is a limiting factor? Well, it's uh, anything that's limited or limiting to wildlife. Uh, any of those food, water, shelter, cover, space, um, if they're limited in any way, changed, the arrangement is not available like it used to be or what fundamentally they've evolved or co-evolved with, that could be limiting to, to wildlife. It could be any environmental factor that tends to slow, stop, or limit the population from growing or thriving. And the success of the organism is, uh, is limited by the presence or the absence of these factors. And, uh, um, and so I'm gonna share with you several examples of species and some are gonna be very basic and some are gonna be a little more complex, but I, I hope that, uh, that they will illustrate, you know, what limiting factors uh, can be and also how we may mitigate them or how we can uh, help uh, you know, improve conditions. So it could be, limiting factor could be seasonal food availability, spring, summer, fall, or winter. Uh, it could be a cover thing where there's no winter cover, no nesting cover. There could be limited escape cover. The patch size of the area that the animal, uh, the organism has evolved utilizing could be fragmented or changed, altered in a way that no longer suitable for the animal. And of course, the introduction of invasives can be detrimental to the population of the animal and competition. And other, there's always an other in wildlife management, um, special habitats like vernal pools, uh, non-native diseases, uh, human disturbances, things that we as humans have added to the landscape that never really was here. You know, there were no planes flying around or drones back, you know, you go back not too long ago, or whatever, um, unleash pets and dogs and um, all kinds of things. And we'll, we'll talk about some of that, okay? So once we remove the limiting factor, um, we can, uh, uh, the population can, can uh, increase. So if you remove the limiting factor, it increases and biological diversity improves. Hey, Mindy, um, is there any way that I could get these? Uh, I, I see a lot of icons on my desktop that I can't see my slides. 
Um, Maybe if we remove my co-hosting, or may oh no, I need do I, I know I would need to co-host. No, I don't know how. There, there's a um, okay. I, it'll be okay. I think I'm gonna be all right. Is it like the participant list in the chat box? I just uh, clicked on something. I hope it didn't uh, change something. It said remote control. We can still see your presentation. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're back to normal. Okay. okay so here's a, it's a real busy slide here, but uh, I want you to focus on the term carrying capacity. Um, the average number of animals that live in an area from season to season is um, carrying capacity. The average number of animals that live in an area from season to season. What uh, is important with this concept, it's really the backbone to wildlife habitat uh, management and uh, enhancement. The things that we control as humans directly is the habitat quality and quantity. All of these other factors are very challenging to, to uh, control or have an effect on. And as, if you go around looking at them, they, they're, they're very challenged. But we as humans um, directly affect the habitat and we could improve the quality and quantity directly and indirectly the habitat. The only way you could increase the average number of animals that live in an area from season to season, you know, the only way you're gonna increase them is by improving the habitat. You could artificially enhance them, putting up a bird feeder or you know, stocking animals into an area. Uh, I had a lady once ask me, uh, can I, anywhere I could get cardinals, and put them in my backyard you know, years ago. And, uh, the number of cardinals in her backyard is pretty much going to be stable to the uh, environment that's there. And you can't just stockpile animals into an area expecting to survive there. So habitat. Now, if I had a five gallon pail and I wanted to have six gallons, I, I couldn't put six gallons in a five gallon pail. Wildlife habitat's the same way. If you want to have more animals in an area, you got to increase the size of the habitat. So if the bucket is increased to six gallons, you put six gallons in it. So habitat, quality and quantity, if you improve it, the quality and the quantity, you can improve the average number of animals from season to season that survive there. And you could target whatever animals that you're trying to improve the habitat for uh, if, you're, if you understand their food, water, shelter, cover, uh, and space needs and the arrangement of those things. So it's a real busy slide, but I, I needed to cover that. That's an important one. Now here's the bucket. Now, the bucket represents habitat. The water that's coming in rep represents reproduction. So let's say an animal's reproducing and it, um, it, it's uh, in the habitat and it's food, water, shelter, cover space, and it's um, carrying capacities reached when the, when, the, when the entire habitat's filled when the uh, average number of animals from season to season. What happens to the animals that that can't find food, shelter, cover, or space. Well, you lose them. You lose them to accidents and pollution. You lose them to disease. You lose them to starvation. You may lose them to predators. You may lose them to old age. These are decimating factors, things when, you know, uh, as the population grows. And then in Connecticut and across North America, we also have uh, hunting, regulated hunting. And that's represented by the little hole in the bucket there. And, you could harvest a surplus of animals and keep it at or below carrying capacity. And that, you know, if you look up the hunting guides, you'll see for deer and for, there's a they're regulated seasons. So carrying capacity is reached when the, when, the, when the habitat's filled. The decimating factors you see is the spillage of the water. And then the harvesting, the regulated hunting is the, the bucket represented there, which is regulated by the DEP wildlife biologists through regulations and seasons and bag limits. So that's another way to do it. Now, habitat is the place that provides the animal's basic in requirements, right? It's the address. If you need it, you know, if we're, if we're going to anthropomorphize, you need to write a letter to a uh, rabbit, say, Mr. Contail Rabbit, you know, when, you do, when you're going to send that letter off, it's going to go to a thicket somewhere, okay? Thickets. It's not going to go in the middle of the woods with mature forest. It's going to be where there's thickets and grassy, dense, shrubby areas. Um, so ha think of habitat. If I was going to write you a letter, it's going to go to your house, you, where your address, where you live. Um, it's anthropomorphizing, but to get to give you an idea, habitat is the address where the animals live. Now, some animals will migrate and have two 
places that they live. They might have a winter habitat down in the tropics and it may have a summer range in, up here in, in Connecticut, uh, but it's still, those are seasonal habitats, but it, again, it's the, um, they have a place, an address. Every animal is connected to a particular area that meets its requirements. Some have broad habitat requirements, some have very narrow. Meadow larks aren't gonna be found in the middle of the woods. Uh, they want grassy fields and areas to, that they've co-evolved that with that habitat. So when you ask yourself, what is a limiting factor? It's what defines the ideal conditions for an animal's existence? So if you're a wildlife habitat and wildlife manager, and you want a, uh, ideal conditions for a particular organism, whether it's a bird, a mammal, or a uh, whatever, whatever it is, insect, uh, amphibian, reptile, you want to ask yourself, what, is the, what are the ideal conditions for this animal's existence? And uh, how can I mimic them? And how can I uh, improve them, add, add to it, uh, create that good environment? And then there's this thing called itch, right? It's the job of the animal. Every animal doesn't want to have too much competition when they're out there usurping the resources that they need, the food, water, shelter, covered space. And they've adapted to a particular area like that brown creeper is going to go up the, the bark of that wood and look for bugs. It's got the ability to grab onto the bark and go up. That The job of that bird or the niche that we call niche evolved doing that and it's, it's adapted to that. Um, they have, and birds are great to niche because some forage in the upper canopy, some forage on the park, some forage on the ground, uh, some go into cavities, some like evergreens, uh, some like large form, like uh, disturbed forest, um, but they've all evolved, co-evolved and they all have their uh, niche. And these niches for the niche for the state of that co-evolved originally, if you, if you take a bird or an animal from another country get in and, and it starts you in these areas and competing with these other birds that co-evolved, then you get competition. And that could be a limiting factor for our, the native uh, animals that didn't have that competition originally. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, some examples. Now let's get real basic. If you wanted hummingbirds around your dwelling or where you live or your school or wherever you are uh, during the sp spring and summer and fall, early fall, you got to have tubular flowers. Uh, you could put up a feeder, you know, a little uh, juice container with the proper uh, nectar, uh, but that's not the answer. You have to have these tubular flowers. Well, if you don't have that, it's a limiting factor for, for hummingbirds and it's very basic. And, the more you learn about these native uh, wildflowers that provide that nectar, the more likelihood you're gonna provide habitat for hummingbirds in your environment. Um, so very basic, on a basic level, you can improve populations of, of hummingbirds by providing native nectar sources from the vegetation and the flowers and blossoms on the landscape. An example of a, a patch size or space requirement um, right here in Connecticut. Um, every year, the threatened piping plover, if it doesn't get assisted by biologists and conservation organizations like Audubon Society and others, Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups like Master Wildlife Conservationists and people that volunteer, um, they'd have a tough time. Why? Because you, everybody wants coastal real estate and it's been bought up and it's very expensive and the state has very limited amounts of public on, you know, protected public areas that aren't trampled on by gazillion people and, uh, you know, uh, places for these birds. So um, as an example for this, this animal's limiting factor is a habitat, a coastal uh, area with sandy environments that provide the, 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 the physical features and the food sources of the shoreline. And we know that the, as we go in those areas and you have garbage like this, uh, Norway rats might come in, raccoons, um, things that are detrimental to the nesting birds because these guys nest on the ground. So here you have um, eggs that easily could be trampled by a dog print, footprint, um, 
any any disturbance that they're camouflaged on the ground. And uh, these areas where they're nesting uh, is limited, very limited in Connecticut. So um, very fragile conditions. And biologists have to be, um, be uh, take charge and try to manage these areas for these birds in positive uh, manner. The, the chicks are very fragile. Uh, they could easily be uh, taken by a, a house cat, uh, trampled by a dog, um, disturbed by um, flying kites or pyrotechnics, whatever, firecrackers. Um, lots of things can affect the, uh, the quality of their habitat. The quantity is obvious. It's very limited coastal environment. So uh, biologists put a lot of resources into this, along with the volunteers of Connecticut, both conservation groups. They, they'll put up these predator fences where they can uh, hopefully stop a dog or a cat from getting into the core of the nesting habitat. They'll put up signage, try to educate folks. They'll put these monofilament lines to keep the gulls from getting from the top, uh, getting in from the top to, uh, to take the chicks because the ring bill gulls, the ones that hang out at McDonald's and at the local um, grocery store when you throw a French fry out the window, those ring bill gulls are populations are artificially enhanced and they could end up causing, um, uh, you know, the detrimental population losses to our, to these fragile birds. And of course, this is an example of joyriding. Um, somebody took their Jeep out there and, or whatever off-road vehicle they were using and ran over the signs and who knows how much destruction that caused. Um, so, um, the limiting factor, I, I shared some with you. At the end of the day, it's peer uh, understanding and peer pressure that will stop in uh, education. Uh, do we value piping plovers? Do we consider them valuable as a society? Are we uh, willing to sacrifice a little bit of our coastal lands to uh, make available nesting habitat for the piping plover? Or are we selfish and we want to uh, just have it for ourselves and uh, disregard this species. So um, the challenges are to educate everyone. And I believe peer pressure would stop people from doing this. If people really understood the, the needs of the piping plover, they might uh, make a positive effect and they would um, protect these areas and, and not allow this kind of things, negative uh, things to happen. Um, if you ask me back 30 years ago when I started in this field, uh, you know, dogs were going to become a huge topic for uh, um, ground nesting birds or disturbance habitat. I, I wouldn't have believed it, but just take a walk at any of our WMAs that's near sub near suburban area. And uh, we all, you know, everybody, all the pet owners, uh, unfortunately, don't abide by the leash laws. And... Um, they can cause uh, detrimental effects to ground nesting birds, both on the shore and inland, on in, in forests and fields and edges. Um, house cat ownership, I can't tell you, you don't want to ever get, don't ever get in a discussion about house cat um, management with the public because you'll, you'll get a lot of interesting, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, very passionate opinions, but here are the facts biologically. Uh, and I and I walk on a walking trail here in, in my town, and I see food being stashed in the bushes and underneath buildings, and, and uh, I cringe. Why? One fertile female. What can? How much offspring could they have? Well, in seven years, the offspring of the offspring of the offspring can can have up to 40, 420,000 cats. They can produce, uh, you know, two to ten kittens at any month of the year. They could um, produce up to three litters a year. They can live up to twenty-seven years. Feral cats only live three to five, and they can uh, have a very large home range, one point five square miles. So we'll leave it at that. Self-explanatory. Definitely a limiting factor for a lot of creatures out there.
one of my favorite birds that they call it the um, the um, uh, charismatic megafauna, charismatic megafauna, charismatic uh, bald eagle. Um, when I started working for Deep in 1990, there was only one breeding pair up in Barkhamstead in 1992. Today we have over uh, 65 to 70 nests, active nests in Connecticut. Um, why did that, why is that? Why were they, why had they declined? Well, we, we all learned that DDT that was being spread in the environment, biomagnified in the fish. In other words, a fish ate 10,000 mosquitoes or insects that had DDT sprayed on them. The fat of the fish then biomagnified the DDT, the, the eagle eats the fish, then uh, ha causes reproductive issues and the population crashed. Biologists finally figured out, well, this is what's going on. The, there's a biomagnification of DDT going on, on out there. The populations are declining. Ospreys met, had the same problem. Remove the DDT, eliminate the source, clean up the fish populations, no more DDT uh, being biomagnified in the environment. Population recovers. Um, the huge limiting factor for this, the, these birds of prey. Um, a, um, a habitat plant, one of the majestic American chestnut. Somebody imported a um, somebody imported a um, Chinese chestnut tree that was an orchard tree into the United States. Had a blight on it. The blight, unfortunately, transferred to our American chestnut, and we lost by in 40 years. It started in 1904, and in over in just under 40 years, it destroyed our American chestnut population. And they're now little shrubs in the tree. They're, they only grow for 25, 30 feet. Very challenging to, to get rid of this limiting factor because the blight is uh, very challenging to eliminate. And uh, because the tree's not reproducing very much anymore, it can't adapt to that uh, disease. Bio, um, researchers have been studying it and, and trying to uh, um, plant resistant varieties. We did that at Sessions Woods. We've done it on private land. Uh, scientists are trying to figure it out. And now they're, they're going into genetic modifications, adding a genetic modification to try to uh, cause the plant to be resistant by putting, splicing in resistant uh, genes into it. Um, very challenging once this limiting factor uh, hit the landscape for this American chestnut. The detrimental effect to wildlife was unknown because nobody was studying it at the time. But Purdue University did a feeding habit study where they fed American chestnut and other masks to mammals and they found that they preferred the American chestnut. So who knows what effect it had had. Uh, and hopefully we'll get this tree back in our forest, but, but it's uh, um, one that we've lost. And that limiting factor is gonna be challenging to eliminate and hopefully it will, but another uh, limiting factor. Space could be a limiting factor, space. Uh, in your, if you drive around your town and look around, you notice there's not a lot of farms anymore. If you look at Connecticut in 1810, uh, by 1810, we had 1,200 dairy farms and we had lost most of our forest. And we only had 25% of the forest and our, we had plenty of fields. Um, the bobolinks need five acres minimum of grassland. Those 1,200 dairy farms, now we only have 150 dairy farms, just to give you an idea of how uh, little grassland we have anymore. And then... Um, the uh, patch sizes uh, for bobolink, it's five acres minimum. For things like meadowlark, it's 10 to 20 acres minimum. So patch size you could have a grassland, but if the patch sizes are smaller than the, these numbers, uh, you, you very rarely get these birds nesting successfully there. So um, the limiting factor for these grass and birds are, are, can be patch size. That's one of the limiting factors. And, um, so the more you could um, conserve bigger patches of woods, I mean, of, uh, of, um, of grasslands, the more likelihood you can have these two species uh, thrive. If you want to see bobolinks, you go up to Tops Mead State Forest. There's uh, um, uh, 60 plus acres of fields up there and other parts of the state. Uh, we have uh, uh, like up at Suffield WMA and uh, um, we're establishing large uh, grassland areas 
and there's land trusts that also have, uh, you know, large patches of grassland that they're managing. Grasslands are important to uh, the patch size, um, to, um, to, to uh, make sure that you have um, diversity of the, uh, of the patches. Um, when we look at, when we look at, um, you know, um, when we look at grasslands, we, we want to have quality, not just quantity. Um, we could have the size. We want to make it as big as we, we can, uh, conserve as big an area as we can, but also the structure of it and the, and the plant diversity is important as well. We like to add in native grasses to our grasslands. These uh, native grasses, instead of being what they call cold season grasses or like turf grass where they, they just are very tightly knitted grass. These are have nooks and crannies in them where animals can forage. They can look for bugs and insects and there's diversity. It's not, uh, uh, they're, they're very, they're much more beneficial to, to the native wildlife. And also um, what can be limiting to some of these grassland birds is mowing. Um, if you mow too early, um, you know, when, when, when is it a good time to mow? And this is very challenging. If you practice wildlife management, habitat management, and you have fields that are under your job duties, you'll find that it's very challenging to manage properly because you need, you need to pay attention to the timing of the mowing and then also the resources needed to mow. Because if you don't mow a field at least once a year or once every two years, you will get woody vegetation and it'll convert back to forest. So um, mowing uh, later, mow, mowing after the growing season is great if you could do that. Um, but um, most of the time we have to delay that first hang of the, of the uh, farmer so that you can still get some nesting in, delay the first mowing, you won't destroy the nesting, but it's a balance. Sometimes you have too much land you don't have any enough help to manage uh, those lands or mow them. So you have to have, you, you lease it out to farmers and then they can, you have, you have to, you know, put limits on when they delay their mowing at their first mowing. And we get some success with that when we do that, especially our larger fields. And sometimes we get, we get uh, farmers to agree to just do mulch on the field, take the mulch at the end of the season, growing season, so you've gone past your, your nesting season. On state land, we, we mow half our fields uh, on some of them and we lease some of the fields. Um, so we, we do some on our own with our own staff where we mow half, half the area like a Goshen, Suffield, this, just today, Suffield was being mowed. We're mowing half of it one year and then you leave half of it unmowed and then you alternate um, the mowing each year, you know, every other year. Um, here's an example of what can happen if you mow too early, if you hay too early. Um, this field was hayed and a hen was sitting on six eggs, uh, a hen turkey, and uh, it got bailed up into the hay bale. Um, and um, it, 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 it definitely can happen. And um, you, you have to, you know, uh, delay, if you delay mowing, you, this won't happen. Less likely to happen. On our fields, we are, uh, we, this is a true axe planter, specialized planter that no-till seed plants. Um, all this fluffy seed that you see here, we put in the bins and we, uh, we, we're converting a lot of our fields to these native grasses and they're improving the uh, quality of those uh, grasslands for grass and birds and other grass and species that use it. Um, I want to share with you a personal example of um, Monarch. Uh, this, this, I took this photo at Hammonasset State Park. I was, my wife and I were uh, reading a book late, 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 uh, early evening. And um, it was pretty brisk. So we decided to head back to the vehicle. And I couldn't believe the number of monarchs flying through the air and landing on the uh, the evergreens along the road there, along the beach. And I thought that only happened in Mexico. Um, anyway, uh, the hundreds and hundreds of monarchs are landing and I 
took this photo and uh, I wish I had taken video. I didn't know how to do that with my photo camera, but now I do. But at the time I didn't take a video, but I never seen that many monarchs going through that area in my, in my lifetime. Um, but it's cool to see. We know that um, the limiting factor for these monarchs is not buddleia. Okay, people plant buddleia. You go everywhere and everybody's all excited about planting buddleia. They see all these butterflies flying around. It's nectar. It's not, it's not going to be much. It's like us going to 7-Eleven and getting a big gulp and drinking it down and saying, wow, we're healthy. Well, monarchs need more than buddleia. They need a larval food, a place to lay their eggs. They don't just need to get nectar. So they need to have monarch, they, they need to have milkweeds. Um, so in order for them to breed, and I'll cover that over for everybody here so we uh, don't get it, uh, in trouble for uh, showing this one. But I use this slide all the time to illustrate that um, milkweed, without milkweed, there's no reproduction. The, the animal can't find a place to lay its eggs and then to uh, propagate its, its progeny, you know, propagate its species. This is on our land in Sprague and uh, my, my family and I um, planted milkweed out there and my two sons, uh, Neil, Neil, my son Neil passed away recently, but Neil and Anthony, uh, they were helping me catalog some butterflies out there one day. And um, we, we were, I saw them, you know, we were chasing butterflies around identifying them. And one goes, Dad, this one here's distorted. There's something wrong with them. So we go over there and there they were, they were, it was a, it was a breeding pair of uh, monarchs. And uh, it was cool because I was all smiles because I'm like, this is, shows the result of, remember when we floated in those milkweed pods, the seeds into the field when it was, when we were originally establishing this five acre meadow and we cultivated them in the ground. And now we have breeding monarchs on our land. So the monarch butterfly, the limiting factor is Asclepiuses, all the genus Asclepius. There's three native Asclepiuses, or there's five, but there's three very common ones that you could plant and you can make a difference. So eliminating the limiting factor is very simple. Allow Asclepius species to thrive on the landscape and uh, don't chop them all down and get rid of them, and turn them to turf, uh, you know, create patches of them and enhance areas with Asclepiuses, milkweeds. Uh, this is Asclepius tuberosa. This is uh, one that uh, is very, um, uh, you know, found along the shore, dry areas. This one had 13 caterpillars on it. Another limiting factor uh, that is forest related is disturbance habitat, young forest. And these species that I'm going to show here, just a side of warbler, American uh, woodcock, the whippoorwill, and the tohi, they depend on disturbance habitat, young forest. And uh, you're going to say, well, why, what's going on with young forest? Well, in Connecticut, if you go back to the 50s, there was about 30% of our forest was young forest. And of course, in the Industrial Revolution during the Roaring Twenties, all those farms were abandoned and there's lots of young woods. And then if you go back and look at um, hurricane events, every hundred years hurricanes come through Connecticut, we denuded the land by 1810, we had only seven, we had 70% um, of our land in Connecticut was pasture or field. Anyway, disturbance habitat is, is today only about 5%. Uh, the forests that grew back in, in, uh, after the Industrial Revolution, they're all about the same age, 80 to 20, 80 to 120 years old. And there's not a lot of young woods because the disturbance, those 100 year hurricanes um, that occurred pre-colonial um, that just that made that forest uneven age, or, you know, they, they don't happen as much. If you were uh, to evaluate the forest, and you are a forester, you know that there's seedling sapling, there's pole timber, and there's saw timber. And there's wildlife associated with each one of these habitat types, um, the, 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 the structure. And um, we know that the seedling sapling is very low today. We know that the pole timber is about 25%. And then the saw timber, the larger trees, are now 70% of our woods. And so the U.S. Forest Service, every five years, does an evaluation of our forests, as well as our DEP 
Forster's, but there's an overall evaluation. You could look it up online and, and you could see the trends over the years that they've been monitoring Connecticut. And every state has a, uh, USDA has a report for it and you could look that up. But the conditions of the forest reflect the wildlife that's found there, okay? So if you don't have a balance of seedling sapling along with the mature woods, you're not gonna have um, the diversity of young, the di disturbance forest species available. Uh, and then of course the, the, the mature woods or the maturing woods, the saw timber forest, you need large blocks of those as well to maintain uh, what we call forest interior species that require um, like cerulean warbler and wood thrush that need larger blocks of forest, uh, of older forest. In Burlington at Sessions Woods, we've, we created two patch cuts, one in 2001, 14 acre, where we cut everything down to two inches to create these disturbances within the woods. And then we did a 33 acre one. And these are the birds that we found nesting there after we did those cuts. And those are all disturbance dependent species that now breed there. So we added that breeding, those breeding populations by uh, creating these patches of, uh, of young woods. And of course we uh, harvested the timber for that. And then that was sold, that was sold to, to the highest bidders that, that, that had to remove and bid on those, on those jobs. So shrubland seedling, shrub, seedling shrubland habitat can be limited and the species that you see here, without those young forests, they're not gonna be able to breed or find breeding locations here in Connecticut. So as habitat managers, we can add those features um, and mimic the uh, disturbances that would occur, that did occur uh, naturally. Now, if you go back to 1938, that was the last category five hurricane that came through Connecticut. Only 17% of Connecticut was saw timber forest back then. So just imagine what it would be like now with 70% uh, saw timber forest in Connecticut. It'd be a lot different when we get a hurricane, which we're due for one, a hundred year storm, hundred year hurricane. The cottontail rabbit uh, is limited by disturbance, not having enough disturbance habitat. Um, there's two species. One was introduced, was the Eastern, and then the New England is our native one. And we tried to not get it listed. Uh, US, US Fish and Wildlife didn't want to, they noticed it was declining. Uh, tr the New England cottontail was declining, so they wanted to do something about it. They evaluated the, the different options, and one was create disturbance habitat. Here in Connecticut, that's what we've done. And um, the eastern cottontail, which is the non-native one that was brought in during the 30s, um, nobody knew that it was non-native. They thought it was a same rabbit, but that little star on its forehead here, you can differentiate the Eastern from the New England. And um, the, uh, the New England is the one that's declining, that has declined. Now for habitat, if we, we can create young disturbance forest by using these different things, forest operations, planting, seeding, mowing, bush hogging, and prescribed fire. In the case of uh, cutting the woods to create it, you take pole timber like this, and then you could hire a company to take down everything down to two inches in a patch. This was done at Camp Columbia. And then you could mimic a disturbance and then have the young forest grow up. And right adjoining this patch right here is a native New England cottontail population that was established and being monitored by a biologist. And th those Po that population moved right over to this, to these brush piles in the, the new, the newly created disturbance forest that was next door, right adjacent to the existing population. So we could have, uh, we could mitigate it and improve the conditions by, in this case, by creating a disturbance, by harvesting the, the wood, creating brush piles and creating young woods. In Connecticut, there's a few snowshoe hares. We're at the very southern limit of the um, of the New England, of the uh, snowshoe hare population, and um, it's limited by young forest habitat, and it's limited by uh, swampy uh, cedar glades and uh, 
uh, very limited environment for the snowshoe hare. But young forest habitat it can benefit as well. Um, I mentioned that you need young, larger forests, ma maturing woods, saw timber size or bigger. Um, the wood thrush needs 30 to 50 acres minimum of that saw timber sized forest in order to meet its breeding habitat needs. Um, that's just one example of a bird. If, so we want to, that's the importance of protecting larger blocks of forest, uh, land trusts and state of Connecticut towns that are buying up open space to create these bigger blocks to keep uh, sizable forest blocks together of these uh, of this older forest is important in order to meet the needs of these uh, interior forest species that bird species that need uh, breeding habitat. Evergreen habitat could be a limiting factor in Connecticut. Why? Um, the uh, uh, evergreens make up about 10% of the environment. Uh, years back in the 86, we had this uh, Willie Adelgid come in at Storm Gloria, hurricane, and it was in the United States from a, on a Japanese hemlock, and then it was in the mid-Atlantic states, and they think it got blown up through the, through the, with that storm, and it, it started killing off our hemlock, which was only made up about 6% of our, of our uh, evergreen habitat, most shade tolerant tree in North America. Um, that caused the decline of the the hemlock, we don't have any idea how many owls have, can't find their wintering habitat anymore because of that. Um, it definitely caused a, a percentage of our hemlocks to decline. And there's other uh, uh, hemlock scale, there's other exotic bugs that came in that are detrimentally affecting the uh, evergreens. This uh, little patch of evergreens here, this uh, uh, cedar patch here, um, there's a the little solid owl winters in it every year. In the winter, they go in there and they roost during the day. And at night, they hunt for mice and they, lay, they, they bring back the mice, hang them on the branches around them. During the day, they're hiding in that dense clump of evergreens because they don't want to get eaten by other predators. It's a small sow farm in Connecticut. Um, the limiting factor for wintering solid owls are evergreen patches. And uh, if we don't have evergreen patches, you're not going to have wintering owls, sawwit owls, or long-eared owls. Um, so what did we do here with this patch? It's on state land. Um, we went in and we cleared the competition, the hardwoods around these evergreen patches to restore the light to that area and then allow these evergreens to thicken and thrive. We also planted some in there. Um, so you could uh, enhance the evergreen habitat and remove the limiting factor, uh, you know, uh, enhance the, 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 the habitat need that that animal needs, a cover, that evergreen cover. Dead and dying wood can also be limiting to wildlife. Um, snags, um, today, when I first started in this field, um, it was a bigger concern, uh, what they call high grading. You know, you go to a campground, you can't find a dead piece of wood anywhere around because everybody collects all the dead wood first and they burn it up. Today, with all the diseases of trees, we're not, we don't have as much issue with finding dead or dying trees, but we always, uh, we know that without dead or dying trees, you're not going to have cavity nesters finding their nesting and roosting areas like this screech owl that took over the, the pileated woodpecker's hole. Um, we always suggest three to five dead or dying trees per acre and a den tree per acre when we look at uh, forest management plans and we review them as biologists, we always recommend that we maintain at least three to five dead or dying trees per acre and have one potential den tree. If the den tree is still alive, has a good den hole in it, that's a cavity for, uh, for uh, wildlife to utilize for nesting or roosting or raising their young. Um, that's minimal. And then of course on the ground for salamanders and for bugs that, uh, that, are, uh, that utilize the cover in the food source of the dead and decaying uh, wood. It's very important to have large woody debris on the ground. All these things can be, uh, you know, if you take to the extreme of cleaning up the woods, you could remove all the dead wood and you could end up causing a limiting factor for salamanders, for example. You know, when you lift up a log and you find the red-backed salamander, well, if you take all the 
logs on the forest floor and you remove them, there's not going to be much habitat for, for those animals. And of course, we could mimic dead or dying wood by putting six pieces of wood with a hole in it uh, and putting it in the right location. And you could mimic uh, habitat, a cavity nesting habitat. And, and uh, you can do that by uh, adding uh, nesting boxes, mimics the dead or dying trees. This duck almost went extinct, the wood duck, uh, due to the deforestation. Go back to 1810. 75% of Connecticut was field or pasture. Beavers were hardly any existent anymore because there's no trees. And uh, the wood duck plummeted in population. And um, biologists, thankfully, and conservationists figured out, hey, if we put this six piece of wood with a hole in it that looks like a mimics a cavity in a tree, voila, you have, you're mimicking the dead or dying tree with a hole in it and kill you a woodpecker or or uh, hollowed out from disease or carbon or ants. So you're mimicking the habitat, you're mimicking. So by adding in the nest boxes, you've added in uh, its limiting factor and you uh, now bolster the population. One other thing with wood ducks, um, not only did we help them through the nest boxes, but that we also uh, implemented regulated hunting. Uh, what does that mean? There were bag limits, season and season limits and bag limits that were implemented and they, they weren't just taking birds, uh, you know, whenever they wanted to, but that, that was the case pre, pre you know, in the colonial days and the, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, unregulated take now that's strictly regulated. So that's another limiting factor is, uh, you know, you can regulate the take of the population. You can, um, increase the population by limiting the harvest and regulating the harvest, but also putting up the nest boxes uh, increases their population. Uh, hooded merganser is another cavity nester that you'll find um, using those boxes. You also find screech owls in there once in a while. State manages about 800 or more on state land and uh, lots of private owners also, private land people do as well. Um, everybody loves the bluebird, and uh, I always tell everybody, uh, you know, the the um, they live in the one and a half inch hole in a cavity in a tree. Um, uh, this was left up by one of the water companies in Burlington, which I was real happy about, and uh, in in there was a was a bluebird nesting. I'll share with you a, my own personal example. This little gray birch, uh, the ice broke the top off it, so instead of sawing it down, I left a six foot stem, it was five or six feet stem, it was broke off. And one day I'm driving out of my driveway and I see chickadee building its nest in the, uh, the gray birch and a uh, little, you know, three inch, half inch cavity. I mean, um, little gray birch. I planted those, they were about the size of my pinky back in the nineties. And um, instead of chopping it down after the tree cracked it off the top, after the ice knocked it down, I left it. It wasn't going to be detrimental to falling on anybody. It's only five or six feet, feet tall, no small cavity. And I, and I got to enjoy a, a, a nice brood of uh, chickadees coming in and out of there. It was really neat. Of course, you could put up these boxes, right, with a predator guard, six pieces of wood with a hole in it. Um, you could attract things like bluebirds and tree swallows and wrens and chickadees. Um, you're adding a feature a, a cover. You're, you're adding a type of nesting cover that, it, that it's evolved using. And it's, uh, you, you created it, you, you enhanced the environment. If you went out there and chopped all the dead wood down, they're gonna have a hard time because these birds aren't primary excavators. They use their secondary users of, of cavities that were already excavated. The chickadee can excavate punky wood, but and then comes in the little villain. This guy's the house sparrow. You could do all this putting up these boxes, but this house sparrow can come in and start damaging the, um, the uh, they start competing for those cavities. It was introduced in 1851 from Europe and nobody could believe it, but there's by the, you know, very quickly they expanded their population and it's over 150 million nationwide. Um, these little guys can 
compete directly with our native uh, cavity nesters. Um, you can witness it uh, if you if you manage boxes. You know, here's in my, this was in my backyard. The invasive house sparrow took over the native wren's nest, and um, there's the eggs there. You can see the eggs. Uh, um, here's the detrimental effect of the uh, house sparrow. They chopped it. They cut the heads, pecked the heads of the uh, native birds, and um, very very bad uh, competition with our native species. This was at our land in Spray, Connecticut. I have about eight boxes up there, nest boxes. Um, luckily, the native uh, or the non-native house sparrow populations are not protected by law. So if you learn their nest, uh, what you know, they, they make these kind of uh, dis discombobulated nests. There are lots of wrappers and feathers and you know, uh, net, uh, you know, grasses that they put in there and their eggs are speckled like that. If you can learn to identify what they look like, we, you can manage them. And as habitat managers, when we manage our boxes on state lands and we, we do uh, oust the house sparrows from the nests and we uh, encourage our native nests, nesting species. Um, you could also reduce the whole of your box if you uh, are squeamish about managing the house sparrows, the invasive house sparrows. If you uh, reduce your boxes to seven eighths of an inch hole, only the house wren can go in and out, but you exclude all the other native birds like the, the uh, bluebird. The house sparrow can't get in that seven eighths inch hole. So you're gonna be only getting house wrens uh, to nest. Uh, but we find out at night mice come in and they chew up the holes and you could get, uh, they, they end up expanding the hole anyway. And a lot of people think they do good things when they put up condo complexes for these birds and all they're doing is encouraging more house sparrows. So don't do that. Uh, just put one box up and make manage that one box in the, in the area. Uh, starlings is another invasive that comp competes directly with our native cavity nesters. Um, they started, uh, they were released in 1908, eight pairs in Central Park in the Shakespearean play. And they spread uh, the West Coast by 1950. In short 45 years, they hit the West Coast. That's how fast they expanded their populations. Just imagine all the nest cavities that they were ousting during that uh, population expansion. And they, they really are detrimental. Tops Mead State Forest, we have a kestrel nest in the first two years, they raised broods. And then the, the following years, the starlings took over the boxes and very, very tough to get the kestrels to nest again. Um, they are, the, the starlings are not protected by law, so we can take action against them. The problem is finding them at the right time and getting them out of there before the kestrels give up nesting. Very challenging limiting factor that these, the, the starlings. Um, not all non-native uh, animals are, are detrimental to the environment. Here's the, the ring-neck pheasant. And uh, 20,000 are released every year for hunting purposes, harvesting by hunters, but none reproduce. If you go to South Dakota, there's uh, 5 million of them uh, because there's proper habitat. So uh, the, the, the limiting factor for pheasant is farms and grasslands. Luckily, they're not doing, you know, they, they don't, they, they're, you know, that's not an issue here in Connecticut, but in South Dakota, they're all over the place and they are enjoyed by, by hunters, but this exotic does not expand because the population is not finding its food, water, shelter, cover, and space needs. So in the case of the ringneck pheasant, Connecticut doesn't have good habitat for that breeding uh, environment, as opposed to the starling and the house sparrow that's thriving in cavities. Another limiting factor, um, snakes taken on the chin in Connecticut, anywhere where there's fragmentation. The timber rattler is protected by law. And if you look at where they used to occupy here in Connecticut, the green areas, now they're down to these very few areas. Um, why, did, why is that the case? Well, first, we have a lot of fragmentation and land authorization. They need to go down under the frost line. They have dens 
And uh, of course, the um, people are scared of venomous snakes. And uh, the limiting factor for them are these dens that go under the frost line. And if they're in the old days, they used to dynamite them out. They used to destroy them. They used to go, uh, people illegally collected them and the population crashed. And um, now they're barely hanging on in certain parts of Connecticut. Uh, what are we doing about them? We have laws that protect them. We have people that monitor their, net, their denning areas so that they don't get um, you know, raided by uh, pet, uh, pet trade, illegal take. Um, copperheads are also there, but uh, copperheads are still fairly abundant. They're not uh, in, in dire need as the, uh, or in, in limited, as limited habitat as the timber rattler. But the two venomous snakes, the, the, the timber rattler and the cop, northern copperhead, the timber rattler is the one that is in most uh, limited, uh, limited condition uh, with, the, with those denning sites. The copperheads on the basalt ridges, they, they, like, they like to, they'll, they'll go in the rubble of the glaciated till from the basalt ridges and they're more common uh, out there. And the other thing is misidentification. Um, things like the hognose snakes, a species of special concern. The limiting factor for them is people don't, can't identify, they think they're venomous and they'll, they'll inadvertently kill them or they're, they're, they're uh, collected or they're, but um, um, misidentification is, is a limiting factor for the hognose uh, where they're not, you know, they, they, they're, they're, um, they're, they act, these hognoses, they're not venomous, they're, they're, but they, they act and they scare folks and they, people end up hurting, you know, killing them. Misidentifying uh, northern water snakes for copperheads as well. Um, the other limiting factor for reptiles are the turtles. And whenever you have a red maple swamp in a forest, and, all, and then you have, you, you crisscross it with new roads, you, you add uh, conditions where they could die and get hit. And uh, the limiting factor could be just road killing, uh, you know, animals trying to cross the road. Um, turtles like the box turtle that live up to 60 years. Uh, we find that when they cross roads during the breeding season, because they're fragmented habitats now, as the more you fragment their, their uh, habitats, they're going to be more likely hit by cars. And also the illegal pet trade. Um, today, you can't uh, possess eastern box turtles, and uh, more and more people are helping them cross the road and helping them uh, you know, not get hit by cars. Uh, but it is an ongoing challenge for this species of special concern uh, where they, um, you know, their populations are not a lot of recruitment of young. A vernal pool could be a limiting factor for what we call vernal pool specialists. Um, what's a vernal pool? It has water at least two months of the year and it doesn't have um, fish. It has no outlet stream, no inlet or outlet permanently doesn't have a fish population. These vernal pools, a lot of times can get bulldozed because they, oh, it's dry, there's nothing in it. Whereas it's only seasonally wet. And uh, some of these um, areas are important for amphibians. And um, the wood frog and the Jefferson salamander is an example of obligatory. They, they need those, those vernal pools to, to breed. Um, the spotted salamander might be fine with fish some fish in its in its uh, vernal pool where it, where it lays it's not in its uh, breeding habitat, but the wood frog and the Jefferson salamander require fishless uh, bodies of water with with pools. As people um, as we fragment the land and these vernal pools, whether they get altered, bulldozed, filled in, uh, drained, uh, altered in any way, um, people they are regulated usually by the local wetlands commissions, but Without people understanding their, their benefit to the environment, um, they end up getting altered. And uh, so there's a challenge for amphibians that require these vernal pools. Um, this Jefferson salamander species, I accidentally found one in my garage when I was digging it out, leveling it when we first moved in here in Southington. And my father-in-law and I pulled up this big boulder out of the ground and out crawls this Jefferson salamander. And I called up at the time, Julie Victoria, and I said, Julie, I found this Jefferson salamander in my garage. She's like, oh, there's none found in, in Southington. 
And I said, uh, well, I got one. I found one in my garage. So they, her husband's a herpetologist, Hank Bruner comes over and we walk the woods behind my house. We find this vernal pool. He dips the net and he finds all these larval Jefferson salamanders. It was huge. They'd never been documented in Connecticut. I mean, in Southington, my town, my hometown. Um, that vernal pool it sustains that Jefferson salamander population. I had found one in my garage after digging out that big boulder. And um, we traced it back to that vernal pool, which is in Southington. And now we documented another population of Jefferson salamanders. But that vernal pool is so important for that existence, for the existence of that population of Jefferson salamanders and other amphibians that require that environment, like wood frogs and things. Okay, I'm going to end this uh, talk uh, with this for you. Um, I hope that I've uh, impressed upon you what limiting factors, some limiting factors that are out there. You know, we could, every animal has food, water, shelter, cover, space requirements. And all animals, you can figure out what those needs are and you could figure out the um, requirements. And you, and then if you become an applied scientist and applied applied management strategies to improve conditions so that that population can grow of that whatever animal you're trying to, to restore, um, you can do that. And you can, you, you know, you, you, it's kind of like being a detective and you have to piece all the puzzles together and find out and then build that, you know, enhance that new habitat. This little slide right here is, is sort of, I want to just leave you with this concept. The balance between habitat and wildlife, the balance in all these things affect land use decisions, our culture, federally owned property, state owned property, town owned property, politics, all these things affect the balance between wildlife and habitat. We all um, are participate here, you know, we're part of this landscape in Connecticut. There's about a little over 3 million acres and there's about 3 million people. The landowners that own and manage those lands, the opinions and attitudes and understanding of the folks that, that own the land determine the future of wildlife. You folks, me, you, whether we own a quarter acre or manage an area, we have permission to manage an area or you, your, your, your relatives or friends and people that you know uh, have the land, uh, whether it's a land trust or whether it's state of Connecticut property or town property or school property, wherever you are, um, if you could affect the opinions, attitudes, and understanding of the folks that own that land um, and consider the food, water, shelter, cover, space requirements of species that, that you're interested in in your town, species of special concern, endangered species, threatened species, common species, whatever they are. If you can improve the opinions, attitudes, and understanding of the folks and make a difference for wildlife, um, you can help wildlife create, you know, into the future. So th at the end of the day, um, the limiting factors, if you discover what they are, you add in or remove those limiting factors, you add the right ingredients into the, the animal's habitat, they'll thrive and they'll, and they'll um, but it begins with the opinions, attitudes and understanding of the folks that manage those lands to make that decision, to make that difference. And we, we want and hope that Connecticut's always gonna have a biologically diverse population of animals. You as students um, and as advisors, you, you hold the key to future generations and learning about this stuff. And I hope that uh, you guys make a difference little by little, one, one animal at a time in your local environment local, state level, town level, whatever, however level you want to go. And now this is what we try to promote here at the Connecticut Environment. And I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. And I guess we have some time for question and answer. Okay, Mindy. Yeah, um, so we actually made it so you guys can unmute yourselves and ask questions if you would like, or you can write your questions in the chat box. So feel free if anyone has any questions, now's the time to ask them. Either unmute yourself with the button. Um, I believe it's on the bottom left-hand side. 
or use the chat box, which is also in the um, toolbar below. Hi, Pete. It's, Hello. How are you? Hey, hi, David. Nice to hear. You. Sorry, this is for the, the kids should be asking the questions, but I was just curious. It's just really a privilege, first of all, to have you present this. Thank you very much. And it's music to my ears, to our ears. Um, to Audra is here as well to, to hear you presenting this. Thank you, David. I, it's, it's great to have you continue participating in all your leadership here. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering, I uh, was seeing all kinds of cottontail, high population of cottontails. I don't know if they're Eastern or New England, but um, can you um, can you maybe um, respond to the population kind of cycling of cottontails? And I don't know if the bobcat is part of that or. Okay, so uh, yeah, David, that's a great question. Um, for cottontails, uh, there, there's a two populations. There's the Eastern and the New England. The New England is the native one and the Eastern. Uh, people around their dwellings, around where they live and around the school, usually uh -huh. open grassland, grassy lawn areas. They're usually uh -huh. seen the Eastern cottontail. Um, so, but what happens is there, we, are, we have created uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of acres of young forest habitat on state lands and on private lands to try to increase the New England cottontail population. But every year, uh, the Eastern cottontail that's very visible around people's houses, you, you notice them during the summer, they increase and see them a lot. And then some years you'll see more than others. Um, uh, they don't truly cycle like they do up north. There's a, up north, if you go into Maine and the where there's um, the, the, the lynx and the, the snowshoe hare, there, there's a cycling of, uh, when the snowshoe hare population is up, the, the usually the, the lynx population is low. And then in Connecticut, we've never established that correlation of uh, predator prey with the cottontails. Um, but up north, if you look at, there's a lot of modeling of populations of lynx, which is related to the bobcat and uh, snowshoe Hairs, um, there was there's a high correlation when there's lots of uh, links. There's fewer, you know, the population of snowshoe hares depressed. When there's fewer links, there's more uh, snowshoe. We've never seen that happen here in Connecticut. Not that we've never seen it it's documented. So we haven't documented that correlation, a predator prey relationship. But there's definitely uh, fall, is, summer and early fall is peak cottontail population and people tend to see more of them during that summer and early fall. And then at the end of the winter, they, you know, usually the population is very low and they're not as visible. And plus they go into more thicket areas. And they're not as visible out in the open. Um, but to answer your question, is there a correlation between predators and cottontails? We've never established a cycling effect. You know, we have like a 10 year cycle like they do up north with the snowshoe hair and the, and the uh, lynx. Uh, so it has never been established here in Connecticut. There's lots of bobcat studies going on here. And, you know, they may find some food habits correlations in the, you know, over the years, because now it's been about four years they've been studying them. And it'd be interesting to see if they can correlate food habits, you know, when they've come, what they're eating certain years, if they're more abundantly eating rabbits versus mice and things like that. But we don't have, we have not, None of the biologists here that I'm aware of has established that correlation. Thank you so much, Pete. You're welcome, David. Thank you for your question. That was a very good question. Anyone else? David, I guess I want to add to that question a little bit. And uh, house cats can depress local cottontail populations around you know suburbia and then some even some farmland areas where there's wild wild feral domestic cats so um they've definitely correlated lots of cat populations with you know killing birds and mammals and including rabbits yeah. um, but but uh but you know that's more of a, a feral cat um you know they do depress local populations of animals. 
Gotcha. Artificially, you know, artificial kind of additive mortality. It's a artificially additive, uh, unnatural, considered unnatural for the animals to get that uh, mortality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Don't be afraid. Hi, Pete. It's Audra. Hi. How are you? Yeah, you? Good, thanks. Um, we were just talking the other day about the chronic wasting disease. Has that progressed? Is it stabilized? Is it, what are the percentages like? So for everyone out there, chronic wasting disease is a disease of white-tailed deer and, uh, Fortunately for Connecticut, we don't, we've never documented any here in Connecticut. We have a monitoring program where they, you know, we, our deer biologists have tested heads, uh, deer heads and looked at uh, whether it's found here. Other states, uh, we you know you can't import uh, animals from other states. They can only, if the hunter gets a deer out, other, you know, a lot of the other states where chronic wasting disease occurs, they, they can't bring the bones back to Connecticut. They can only bring the meat so they have to debone everything. So uh, luckily, Audrey, it's been uh, chronic wasting disease. We've prevented it from entering Connecticut through the proactive strategies of our deer managers. Our deer biologists have, you know, quickly put a moratorium on the importation or the trans, you know, interstate uh, transfer of, of uh, deer from other states. So hopefully, we will continue to keep it out of Connecticut. Uh, chronic wasting disease. Doesn't you know? It's, it hasn't been known to transfer to humans, but it is uh, a very uh, tragic disease for uh, for the whitetail. Thank you, Pete. You're welcome. All right. So I think that concludes the presentation. Thank you again for presenting and stay tuned for recording of this workshop on our website. And you'll also hear from P again throughout the year because he is the wildlife. Um, once again, just like I mentioned on Monday, please let us know if you have any ideas for the future as far as workshop formats. Um, I mentioned Kahoot or iNaturalist as options. Um, and then also feel free to message me with any comments, questions, concerns um, at ptenvirothon at gmail.com. And the next webinar week will be January 11th through the 15th. And then we also have our material release tomorrow, which will close out this first Envirothon week. Um, thank you again to everyone that tuned in. We are very excited to have you on our program this year, and we look forward to hearing and seeing you guys all again. Mindy and, um, Chris, Mindy and Chris, thank you for continuing this. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're glad that we found a format that works for a decent amount of schools. And we have about 20 or so registered, so that is awesome that a lot of people are interested and it'll make for a great competition this year. Yep. All right, you guys are good to log off. We'll see you soon. Yep. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Yep. Good night.